Today we're going to be doing an investigation into a proxy botnet service that has been in operation for at least the past six years, but hasn't really gotten any major attention until now. The name of this botnet is MiloBot. Now, if you aren't familiar with proxy botnets, they're, of course, very similar to traditional botnets, which are basically just a bunch of computers that have been infected with malware that gives a hacker or a hacker group central control over all of these infected computers. So it's sort of like a necromancer with an army of the undead or something like that. So the proxy portion of the proxy botnet comes into play when the hacker starts using these remotely controlled computers as remote proxies for themselves, or in a lot of cases, the hacker is actually going to sell time on the proxy botnet to other people like some sort of a black market VPN service. And oftentimes there is a lot of overlap between these proxy botnets and residential proxy services as we're going to see soon. Now, residential proxies are 100% legal, at least here in the US they are, I don't know about other countries, but they're kind of a gray market service because their use case is basically for people who need to hide their IP address or need to be able to change their IP address a lot. But for whatever reason, they can't do this using a VPN or Tor like a normal person. These services are often used by people who are running social media bot farms because when bots use VPN IPs or when they use Tor, they're more likely to get banned than if their activity was coming from a regular household IP address. Now, I'm sure that there are some people out there using residential proxies for something legitimate, but most of the traffic that's going through these is shady at best. So I'm sure that you can understand why you wouldn't want your personal computer to get taken over and become a part of one of these botnet services. So the MiloBot malware, it's been in the wild for a while and at its peak, it had as many as 250,000 unique machines which were being infected by it on the daily. Now, MiloBot primarily targets Windows machines, and like most sophisticated malicious programs, it has multiple stages of execution. The first one is called the Will Exec Dropper, which uses different functions from the Windows API to avoid the payload being analyzed. So the dropper first creates its own exception filter to hide the payload by using the set unhandled exception filter function. And if the program that is containing the malware is ever being debugged, then the custom filter is not going to be called. So this makes it very difficult for both antivirus and security experts to actually detect the payload when they are analyzing a sample of the malware. Now another Windows API that is used in the first stage of the attack is Create Timer Q Timer, which creates a timer for running a function at a specified time. And the function which gets called in this malware sample is one that just tries to divide by zero, which of course is impossible. So because we're trying to do something possible, it raises an exception, which triggers the unhandled exception filter that is containing the payload that was registered earlier to be called. And at this point, the anti-malware isn't going to analyze the program anymore. It's no longer going to be running in a sandbox because the whole point of going through all of these steps and waiting to do things is to wait until you're out of the sandbox and until the time when antivirus is analyzing you is over before going on to the next step, which is to decrypt the shell code that was stored in that unhandled exception filter and then inject that into another instance of the original executable, which is another obfuscation technique used by malware known as process hollowing. 
So now we're in the second stage of the malware, which is kicked off from that hollowed process. And here, the malware is going to start checking to see if it is in a virtual machine by looking at the devices that are connected to the system and then checking to see if their name contains the strings VMware, VBox, QEMU, Virtual HD, or anything like that. And the reason for this is to make sure that the malware doesn't end up running in a testing environment for security researchers to observe it or that it's not running in an enterprise's honeypot. Now, at this point, the functionality of the malware differs depending on which version of it is running on your system. Older versions of the malware, what they ultimately ended up doing with your computer and your email endpoint is they used it to send out spam extortion emails uh, that are written in this classic ESL hacker style, you know, they're saying that they have your password and they're saying that they know you went on some adult videos. Oh, you were looking at some crazy stuff, man. So the best thing to do so that I don't tell your dear sweet grandma about your fetishes is you pay me $2,732 in Bitcoin and they give you an address to send it to. Now, obviously, this is some pretty low-hanging fruit. There's not a lot of people that are going to fall for this. And ultimately, this isn't that harmful to the person that has the malware running on their system. Worst case scenario is that a business that falls victim to this, they end up getting their uh, domain blacklisted because obviously the malware is going to be sent out from their domain. So if Gmail or Yahoo is, or if people with Gmail or Yahoo emails are getting a lot of this, then those email services might blacklist your domain and now all of a sudden new customers or existing customers aren't able to get your emails. But of course, the most recent versions of this malware have a much more sinister conclusion, which is turning the victim's PC into a residential proxy. Now, before doing this, the malware runs cmd.exe with the attribute process information w show window equal to zero, which means that the command prompt window is not going to appear to the user at all and the malware injects itself into that command prompt process again, and then from here, it creates registry keys for itself so that the malware is going to have persistence and be able to automatically re-execute and restart whenever the computer is powered on. And the function that creates the persistence in the registry is also responsible for disabling Windows Defender on the victim's machine. And after getting to this point, MiloBot could sit idle for as much as 14 days before attempting to connect to its command and control servers, which is just another way for it to avoid any detection by waiting after it's fully compromised the machine to actually start doing anything really malicious. So there's obviously a lot of obfuscation that's taking place with this malware, but one thing that does really make it stand out is the large number of DNS requests that the malware makes when it's trying to connect to its command and control servers. So older versions of the proxy botnet malware, they had thousands of domains that were hard-coded within it, and they were all usually ending with .ru or .com TLDs and the domain names themselves, they were all like algorithmically generated. They were just like these six or seven character domain names with random letters. Uh, and there were also a bunch of subdomains beginning with uh, either M or X or W and then a number. So MiloBot would cycle through all of these different domains, trying to find an active command and control server to connect to, and this would ultimately produce thousands of unique DNS requests in the process. But now 2022 samples of the malware started using a much more refined approach by limiting the number of URLs to just three randomly generated domains, all ending with .ru. And these domain names were associated with more than 25 different IP addresses between the years of 2017 and 2022. 
And these IP addresses were belonging to various cloud providers like worldstream.nl in the Netherlands, cherryservers.com in Lithuania, and byte.lv in Latvia. Now, once these security researchers had tracked down the IP addresses for the boxes to the data centers that the hackers behind MiloBot were using, it became very, very easy for them to track their activities moving forward. They could see if any other domains were being used with those IPs. And there was one IP in particular, 46.166.173.180, that stood out because a different kind of domain ended up getting registered to it. One that wasn't generated by an algorithm, clients.bhproxies.com. So I visited this site and sure enough, it is a residential proxy service and it's one of the more sketchy looking ones. Uh, the first thing that really stood out to me is there's no HTTPS on this site. So this should be a pretty huge red flag to you too. Next thing is if we look at the background of this website, we have this hooded hacker man in the back with I guess a silhouette of Heisenberg next to their logo or maybe the silhouette of Heisenberg is their logo I'm not entirely sure but all of this just screams very loudly that this is a service that's meant for sketchy hackers I mean it's called BH proxies what do you think BH proxies stand for it stands for black hat and this is further confirmed if you Google BH proxies, because one of the first results outside of the website itself is an advertisement for the service by somebody with the username BH proxies on Black Hat World, which is a forum for discussing Black Hat SEO methods, as well as selling tools, and I guess also discussing tools that are used for Black Hat SEO. Now, for those of you that don't know, SEO stands for Search Engine Optimization. And traditionally, this is something that you would do to optimize a website or possibly a YouTube channel, Facebook page, anything like that for search engines by first figuring out what keywords people are searching for that are relevant to your business, and then make sure that those keywords are in your page's title, make sure that they're in the page's body, and try to even make sure they're in the URL if that's possible. But these days, the best way to optimize your SEO and really get a lot of traffic to your page is to go viral on social media. So a lot of the techniques that you'll see discussed on here, they really revolve around creating bots to interact with social media sites. And like I explained earlier, these residential proxies, they play a huge role in botnets because it is so much easier to ban bots that are using VPNs and Tor versus residential, you know, home IP addresses. So what did we learn from all of this? Well, I think for one, there is pretty good evidence that the person running this site is the same person or at least is closely associated with the hacker that is running the MiloBot proxy botnet. So that's a pretty interesting discovery. But most importantly is the responsibility that we all have to keep our computers safe from malware like this by not downloading sketchy programs and then running them on your PC. Even if something doesn't happen right away, even if you don't get uh, you know, ransomware or ratted right away, it could take up to two weeks before things kick in and then you, know, you start routing traffic or something else starts happening. Because whenever you get infected, you aren't just the only one who suffers. Everyone who is using the internet has to suffer through thousands of inane bots <laughs> because malware turned your PC into a botnet proxy. So keeping your PC secure, it literally makes the internet less polluted. So don't be responsible for bots all over the internet. Like and comment to hack the algorithm. Follow me on Odyssey and have a great day.